Since the Brexit referendum of June 2016, there have been no shortage of words devoted to what happened, how it happened, and what might come of it. This is typical of all recent populist movements and moments that have confounded pundits and pollsters alike. Rather than engaging the referendum directly, today's guest looked at what lay beneath the Brexit vote. Unexamined colonial attitudes of exceptionalism, the legacy of imperial Christian ecclesiology and missiology, and the scourge of white supremacy, entitlement, and privilege. He engaged a liberationist and post-colonial critique of the underlying theological constructs and religious ideologies and sensibilities of Great Britain itself. My name is Liam Miller and this is Love, Rinse, Repeat. My guest today is Anthony Reddy, Professor Extraordinarius in the Department of Philosophy, Practical and Systematic Theology at the University of South Africa. He was recently appointed the Director of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture. He is a leading scholar in the field of Black Theology and editor of the Black Theology Journal. He is the author and editor of 18 books, including Working Against the Grain, Reimagining Black Theology in the 21st Century, Dramatizing Theologies, A Participative Approach to Black God Talk, and the focus of our conversation today, his most recent book, Theologizing Brexit, A Liberationist and Post-Colonial Critique, out now through Outledge. Theologizing Brexit is a provocative challenge to confront the rising tide of xenophobia, and the paucity of any prophetic response to Brexit from church leaders in the United Kingdom. The book aims to be a prophetic post-colonial model of black theology that challenges the incipient sense of white entitlement and parochial nativism that pervaded much of the referendum debate. With that scene set, let us welcome Professor Anthony G. Reddy to love, rinse, repeat. Hello everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat. I am here today with Professor Anthony G. Reddy to talk about his book, Theologizing Brexit. Uh, Professor Reddy, welcome, and thanks for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to join you today. That's great. So, I mean, perhaps some people, you know, might be just tuning in, might not have heard of you or your work before. Uh, you know, they might be picking up from your accent and the topic of the book that you, where you might be from, but do you want to give us a little bit of who you are and, uh, and yeah. how you became interested in, in this topic. Sure, okay. Well, my name is Anthony, Anthony Reddy. Um, born in Britain, born, well, particularly born in Yorkshire, in the north part of, of, of England. Um, the key thing about me is that my parents are from the Caribbean. So they came from Jamaica in late 1950s, a part of the Windrush generation, which some of your listeners may have heard of. Um, they were Caribbean migrants and coasts to come to Britain after World War II to help to rebuild the infrastructure of Britain. So Britain had won the war, but, but taken huge casualties, both, both in human terms and in terms of infrastructure. And so, to put it bluntly, they needed cheap labour to come and do jobs in factories and public services that, for the, for the most part, white British people did not want to do. So, they offered lots of incentive schemes for, for people like my parents to come. They came. I was born in October 1964. Um, and I've been working as a black liberation theologian for about the last 20 years or so in Britain. And so, my interest has been the intersection of race ethnicity, culture, diversity and theology, uh, particularly practical theologians. So I'm interested in the relationship between what we say we believe and what we do. Mm. Uh, and how does practice inform faith and how does faith shape practice? That's my general background. The, the specific interest in Brexit really is, is a very personal one. And so, and so for those who have opportunity to read the book, you'll see it's very personal. A lot of it is about me and my own reflections my own experiences really because i've grown up as a migrant in britain so this is a yorkshire accent so i've got a british passport but all my life in britain and yet it's always been against a backdrop of never quite feeling that one is ever fully accepted as being british and i think what brexit has done is just ramped up that sense of some of us feeling as the other that somehow we have a problem to be solved or problem to be overcome or to be dealt with rather than being seen as a gift to the country which we have been in terms of the work we have done and the contribution that migrants have made um, 
And so really it was that particular issue around how xenophobia and racism and, and particularly white English nationalism was feeding into and still does feed into Brexit and how that is, I think, shaping and polluting our national conversation around identity and belonging. Mm. Thank you for that. That's really excellent to you know, set the ground for the conversation. And it's important to note because, uh, you know, you kind of acknowledge at the start of the book that, you know, this isn't a how did it come that people voted Brexit. Like, you're not kind of writing one of those books. Uh, no. You're looking at the much broader conversation. You're looking at, uh, you know, the underlying theological constructs and religious ideologies that, that create Great Britain as a concept yeah. and, and how that informed the rhetoric you say of the leave campaign. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so what was it, I guess, how has it helped maybe for you or, or, or in conversations since with others to go, no, no, we've got to actually look out, see Brexit, the vote as a symptom and look at a much bigger picture. How has that um, helped the conversation? Do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that is helped to do, Although when I say help, I use that in inverted commas because I'm not sure how much help it's really been at the moment, given how polarised we are, is that, is that we are still mired in a sort of who's to blame kind of rhetoric. And there's very little common ground at the moment. So you have those who are, want to leave, who see the Remainers as these are thwarting the will of the people, they are anti-British, they're not truly democratic in terms of of support the will of ordinary people who voted in the referendum on the other hand you got those who have voted to remain i vote to remain and sometimes i fall into the very thing i'm critiquing if i'm honest with you which is that like you see that those who vote to leave as being small-minded they're racist they're xenophobic they're backward they're not progressive like us remainers and and that binary is I think deeply unhelpful because what it misses is as, as I said the book is a much bigger question particularly for people of faith which is the relationship between nationalism and religious identity particularly Christian identity and what are the fault lines when we talk about Great Britain and what has helped to shape that particular identity where what's fueled a lot of the tensions within the country are set of unresolved conversations about empire and its legacy so, so for the most part we are shaped by the narrative of empire without ever talking about it and without ever acknowledging that it ever happened except for a very lazy type of mythology that is so often invoked by people on the political right so what i'm trying to do in the book is to say actually let's not it's not that they're not important questions about the EU, clearly they are, and they're clearly there has to be some type of resolution around being in or out. But I don't think that, if I'm honest with you, I don't think there was an obvious best rationale for being in or out. There are pros and cons on both sides, and there's no obvious, I would say, ethical judgment that one side can invoke against the other, even though I personally think we should remain in. But but I've had very, very good friends of mine who are about to leave. They're not racist. They're often very, very committed socialists on the left who would say that the European Union is a neoliberal club that punishes people who are trying to work for social justice, a la, look what they did to Greece, for example. And they make convincing arguments for why Brexit should happen, but not from a nationalistic right-wing xenophobic perspective. So I have to take them seriously and say, actually, it's too easy to traduce and stereotype people who you don't like on the other side of the argument. So that's why part of why I, I, I avoided that in the book, because there was no simple answer to give. And also because it's changing all the time, I would have written a book that would have been out of date within a month of it being published. So I mean, that was just a full errand. A full errand, so I skipped that one. But actually, that wasn't the issue for me. The issue for me is a much deeper one, which is about identity and belonging. And why is it that it's very easy to play a xenophobic card? Why is it so easy to get ordinary, decent people riled up and believe that somehow if we stopped immigration, if we stopped migrants, we'd be such a happy, we'd be a much happier country? You know, I mean, why does that rhetoric work all too well? 
that's a question I want to ask. Mm. And I think that comes through well, and maybe we'll get into a little more of that as, as we move on. Um, but before we kind of get there, more talking about maybe the approach to the book, uh, you kind of talk about in the, um, in the introduction, this is a polemical and subjective work. Uh, yeah. And this is there in, um, in Working Against the Grain, an earlier book of yours as well. You know, you're just up front, this is, a, yeah. this is where it is. Um, and in some ways, people might be like, oh, but wait, aren't you meant to be, uh, if you're sitting down to write a scholarly book, um, you know, remove yourself. But the kind of thing you point out is that that's very much part of the problem is that people have felt they have removed themselves, but are just, yeah, um, uh, holding up a mythology um, that's unemployed. So, um, you know, I guess why is it, you already kind of touched on the people, why is it so important for you just to start outright using these terms? Look, this is what I'm doing and yeah. this is what you're getting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest myths, and it partly comes out of a kind of enlightenment kind of tradition, but actually I think it, it, it wants to be really, really rigorous. It goes much further back, goes back to Greek philosophy in terms of notions of objectivity. It's a myth. That the idea that, that one can develop ideas and thought processes that are not influenced by the person who's doing the speaking, that they're not influenced by the social location of the person who's doing the work, that the idea that somehow one can remove oneself and say, actually, let's just look at this phenomena in a rational, disinterested, cool, objective manner is one of the biggest myths often propagated, dare I say it, by white men that often time actually what purports to be neutral is simply the, the interested, self-interested, deeply embedded thoughts of white, particularly white men with power, that then purports to be universal and generic and objective, which seduces you into believing that somehow this is normative, so that when someone else comes along like myself, it's like, oh yeah, but Andy Red has been so, it's been so reactionary, it's been so radical, like somehow like the status quo is neutral and fair. It's, it's none of those things. So therefore what I'm trying to do in the book, and I do it in all my writing, as you quite rightly say, working against the grain, all my stuff. I start in the position of, I am writing this. If someone else were writing it, they'd be writing something different. If, even if we had the same historical material to look at, and the same data on which to draw. We will still come to different conclusions because guess what? We are looking at this differently with different existential experiences and realities and, and processes involved. All I'm doing is just putting on the table all that to say that this is, it's still a scholarly attempt in the sense in which, as you can see, that there's lots of references and footnotes and endnotes. And so, you know, so I've read a lot of stuff and I've analysed a lot of stuff in writing, so I didn't just sit down one day with a bee in my bonnet <laughs> and just get a few things off my chest and just write with a splurge of, I don't know, um, uh, I guess, um, I guess like consciousness raising bile, you know, just to get off my... No, it's, it's a bit more considered, it, it's a lot more considered than that, actually. But, but having said that, its starting point is me as a knowing person. I am a post-colonial subject, born in Britain, but whose parents come from the Caribbean, who were missionized by British missionaries, particularly the Baptist Missionary Society, the Methodist Missionary Society, were probably two main ones in Jamaica, that came from Britain, um, whose forebears before then were enslaved Africans, taken from Ghana, probably West Africa, to the Caribbean by British slave owners. That informs who I am. All that shapes my engagement with the material. Am I being neutral? No, but actually no academic is ever neutral. As I say, I, I, I think the biggest conceit is that people pretend that they are without ever putting on the table how sometimes even in a subconscious way, sometimes we're not always conscious of how our social location and how our education and our background and our experiences shape the fact that when we are making some type of hermeneutical engagement with material, we are making a judgment, we are taking sides, we are offering a, a perspective that someone else from a different perspective looking at the same material would say something very, very different. Mm. 
that's what I'm doing. Really. Mm. And I think, you know, you point out that like, you know, the, a big downfall in a lot of British theology um, is, you know, no kind of uh, acknowledgement of the particularities of the person and their body when they're writing it and the particularities of the history, you know, that, that you're bringing up the, the slave trade. I think that's often, you know, completely kind of pushed out of um, the history of, of that. And, and thus, how can you be writing uh, a theology that really actually attends to the context you're in if you're not actually paying attention to what your place is that, whether it's privileged or disenfranchised, um, and, and the history of, of that too. So I think that comes through really strongly. Um, and, and it kind of, you know, and it touches on exactly that's like the big, you know, the black liberation theology, which is emerges, you know, under the academic scene, at least in kind of the, the late sixties and into the seventies is very, you know, James Cone writing is very much about, you know, just we, how can we be, how can theology have ignored all this, um, except to say that it was, you know, conveniently to do so. Um, was that what kind of, when you first started reading black liberation theology that, that grabbed you or, or was it something else that started to um, speak to you and, and led you down this path? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, actually, um, I, I think what grabbed me about black liberation theology was it provided a missing link to something I've been wrestling with perhaps for most of my format formative upbringing. So I was brought up in a very, very white evangelical Methodist family, um, Methodist church, Methodist culture. My parents were very, very devout, particularly my mom. So we were active churchgoers every Sunday. It was not a choice when I was growing up. You went to church because like, everybody went to church. And, and at one level, it was a fantastic formation. I believed in God, believed in a very personal Jesus, believed Jesus had died for my sins, believed I was loved. There was a purpose in life. It was great at a spiritual and sociological level. The problem was there was this big question around race that was the elephant in the room. So it was a white middle-class church. The few black families sat at the back. We were never given offices to hold. We were largely there, but not really counted uh, as equal as everyone else was. So, so with the Methodism, there was a rhetoric of equality, both within the denomination itself and within broader Christianity. They weren't often heard invoked Galatians 3.28, that in Christ there were not these differences. And yet you saw the differences all the time in the church routinely happening and no one ever talked about it. And, and the underlying default theology of it, even though that wasn't historically when Methodism had started, was relatively conservative. So it was a conservative theology, evangelicalism. But also I think politically, if not certainly very right wing, was certainly mildly to the right and would have assumed that the status quo <laughs> was what God intended and our job was to be good pietistic Christians who would know our Bible, be spiritually filled by the Holy Spirit and lead respectable lives but never ask difficult questions about, about how society was ordered or where power lay or why it was that my father worked in a, in, in, in a factory that was just about unionized where the only other white people were other migrants, so Irish people and Poles, Eastern Europeans, not white English people, because they were too good to work in this factory. And Christianity, now, Christianity had nothing to say about that. So, so as I was growing up, I thought, okay, I, I, I know I belong to this faith and this tradition, but there's something that is not quite right about this. I, in, in myself as a black person, I feel at best I'm intolerated, at worst, people don't really count me as equal to them because of my because of my skin and my ethnicity and my culture, my history, my background, all that kind of stuff. And really corn, so the first book I read was Black Theology and Black Power. Then I bought the volume one of the anthology that he did with a guy called Gerard Wilmot, um, the first anthology. And then when I read that, it was it was like a light bulb going off in my head. It's like bing, that that's the bit that I'm being getting. And so Korn, so what Korn did, Korn filled the gap. Korn said, well, actually, the reason why, well, he didn't say this to me personally, but it felt like he was right for me personally. He was like, well, actually, the reason why you feel like this is because whiteness and Christianity have made this collusive relationship over several hundred years that have constructed a world that makes racism normal 
makes it something that we don't talk about, makes colonialism and the objectification of black bodies normal, makes white supremacy normal. And we'll talk about everything except that. So like we might talk about class. Certainly, certainly I would have, certainly I heard of urban theology and contextual theology, but never heard of black theology when I was growing up. But like we, so we might critique gender in terms of a denomination that, that then began to ordain women in the early 70s. This is the Methodist Church in Britain. But what we won't do is talk about social relationships around race. So like we won't talk about why it is that when you go to a district synod, it's virtually all white except for the odd black person there who sits at the back and we don't take part. We won't talk about why it is that you can go to a theology class and see virtually all white people and read all white books and, and the majority world that comes from the global south that are people of colour don't exist. Um, Cohn was the one who really got, who really just helped me to see the elephant in the room and to name it. And, 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 and in a very simplistic way, I mean, I'm sure my work is, a, well, I hope my work is a lot more than the, just this. But at one level, it's just simply saying, hey guys, there's an elephant in the room. <clears throat> it's big, it's taken up a lot of space, it requires a huge amount of resources in terms of feeding and, and nourishing this elephant. And why are we pretending that it's not there? You know, it's, it is there, it is, it is shaping who we are. In the same way, which like we might go on to in a moment in terms of Brexit, but like the whole phenomenon happens as if somehow race and particularly white nationalism has nothing to do with it. So you can have a meeting of the relative new deformed Brexit party, which is a party that has been formed in order to ensure that Brexit happens. And you can have groups, large groups of white people turning up, regaled in the British flag that obviously belongs to them, don't belong to me or, or, or everyone else, it belongs to them. And they can speak in a, in a very exclusive way about protecting British values and protecting our way of life that does include me, even though I've got a British accent, I've got a British passport. And, and this is a white phenomenon that if you're not white, looks scary like hell. And no one talks about it. No one talks about it. So you get the pictures on the news and you get the newscaster who says, well, and today there was a large march for the Brexit party in some city, blah, blah. And you're looking and you think, yeah, but like, they're all white people. Has no one actually noticed that these all white people are complaining about how their rights have been taken from them and they've been disenfranchised? And somehow they're then labeling other people, but no one talks about it. So, so what I learned from Cohn, principally from, I mean, from lots of other people as well, but principally from James Cohn and from Black Liberation of Theology as a whole, is to name the elephant in the room is to make whiteness own up to being white. Not because there's something intrinsically wrong in whiteness in and of itself, it's just it's wrong when it presumes itself to be superior to and to be normative or the other perspectives. Mm, thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, well, as you're thinking of that normativity of white, you kind of talk about it in the book in the way, you know, protecting Christian Britain. Uh, and what is imaged when people talk about what is, and you, you relay a personal story from, from when you were a youth, um, you know, about like, you know, well, when we think of Christian Britain, we think of a young, white, probably man, uh, middle class, yeah. you know, that, that's what it is. Um, but, you know, Christian Britain, like, you know, the, the growing Christianity in Britain is not white. Um, yeah. It comes from migrant churches and black churches. And, um, and you kind of, yeah, talk about like, you know, you, you then build in that, in that chapter, talk about the Windrush generation as perhaps you know, that is what we should be thinking of when we think of a Christian in Britain. And, and, and you build this wonderful idea of um, embodied Pentecost and, and, and all that. And, that. and we can come to that in a second. But because it also made me think of uh, currently in Australia, we're having like a religious freedoms conversation, which just, you know, has, has to happen now because a Christian got sacked for um, homophobic tweets. So now we have to have the conversation, but it's always interesting of who gets talked to in these. Of you know, it's never the um, LGBTIQ Christians who are saying no. The religious freedom means that actually we're the ones who get sacked. Um, yeah. No, we have to talk to a particular kind because 
this is who it is who's Christian. And they're the ones who get on the panel shows and, and yeah. those discussions. Yeah. So, um, yeah, maybe just uh, invite yeah. you to talk a little about, you know, we've already kind of established that there's this normativity and that's what comes to mind when we say these words, but um, your work to kind of go push another alternative. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad that like you brought in the LGBTQ perspective because that's one that I work with the, in the book on a number of occasions. I mean, not in an absolute overt way, but, but it does come up in a couple of the chapters. Because I think it's interesting that if you look at the people who've been pushing Brexit, and particularly how it gets framed within a Christian discourse, because that, and you're right, the archetypal position, the, the archetypal person that we talk about, Christian Britain, is seen as conservative, politically and theologically, mm. is white, is often male, often Oxbridge, well, certainly privilege, certainly lives in a rural idyll, so it's not part of some ugly, disgusting inner city mess that people often think with their mind. Mm. But often when we talk about Britain, what is Britain? We often think of a pastoral idyll. Mm. It's white. The people are heterosexual, so they're not LGBT persons, and that re and and that and that reflects a kind of normativity as to what is the archetypal Christian person whose values make up Christian Britain that we want to preserve mm -hmm. against the other. That then becomes like the model of that. And what's interesting is how that operates at a very mythical level for two reasons. Firstly, that is not the church. <laughs> that, I mean, that is one little dimension of the church. But, but if that was the only expression of church in Britain, then church would be in a worse state than it's in already, sort of numerically. Because that's, you know, I mean, that's a tiny fraction. But the power of that myth is that the other people then get sucked into it. So I also talk in the book as well, is the way in which people from migrant communities, from other ethnic groups, end up then buying into that and sort of saying, well, particularly given the opposition to LGBT perspectives, to say, well, actually, being an authentic Christian is to defend Christian Britain against these other aberrant positions. But it's not just about ethnicity and migration, but it's also about about assumed sexual deviance and difference that is seen as being deeply problematic. And therefore part of the, the tragedy is the way in which people who are not part of that normative group then end up being, being convinced to support it because they think that by doing so that will enable them to belong. So I wanna just look at two very quick groups, for example, who were brought into Brexit, neither of whom are reflected in that normative framework I've just given in terms of conservative, white, rural, middle-class, male, heterosexual. One is white working class people. That's one of the hardest things about the book was to write in a way that I was not gonna end up attacking people for whom I have some affinity because I grew up in a poor white working class area. And I have many friends, ministers, activists, uh, community workers who are doing really good work working with marginalized, disaffected, um, angry and frustrated, predominantly white communities in many of our larger urban conurbations in Britain. So I don't want to get into it's their fault and I'm going to attack that group because actually they're not the people who were, who were the architects of Brexit. So, so I don't want to attack them, but at the same point though, I do want to critique the way in which they allowed whiteness to suck them into a construct that doesn't care about them. But for the most part, so the people who are supporting this subliminal notion of Christian Britain are people who are not churchgoers themselves. They're not rural, because for the most part, like, they live in any city areas. They're not privileged, because most times they have not done well in education, they're on the margins of society, they're not successful in socio-political terms. So they're buying into a construct of privilege when they themselves have never been privileged, and the people who have not privileged them are not other migrants, well, are not migrants, it is, it, it is the very people that they're supporting, largely conservative, 
rural conservative voting people who don't care about poor inner city people or, or, or people who live on outer estates in some of our cities. So they've been sucked into that. And, and, and as I said in the book, the other group that's sucked into it are often black Christian believers themselves, predominantly Pentecostal, but not just Pentecostal. But we've also been sucked into it because they think, well, actually, as car carrying believers in Jesus Christ, as people who have formed churches and we are part of an, an ethic of Christian respectability, we identify with this construct. And we also think that it needs preserving, even though, again, they don't belong to it and the people who do belong to it don't count you as their equals. It's a classic false consciousness on a whole variety of ways. And part of the power, therefore, I think of this Christian Britain narrative is that it's an explication of a world that was never fair, was never generous to lots of people. And yet, so, and, and yet it's powers because it's in the past, because in the past is all, and the past also looks better than the present. The past is always like this world of nostalgia that we've lost. And would it be great if we could get back to it? Why would we want to get back to something that, that actually marginalised huge numbers of people? So what I often say to church, when, well, I'm just saying, oh, what we need is a revival. So we need to go back to the time when our churches were full. It's like, oh, so, so let's go back to the time where LGBT people were persecuted openly. And you could go to prison for being a gay man. Um, you're a woman, okay, outside of, let's say, Roman Catholicism, now, still, sadly, you, you could not become a priest, you could not hold office in the church. If you're, uh, if you're an ethnic minority, if you were from a, a person of colour, you were clearly had no place in any of the major denominations and no expectation of being treated as equal and no expectations of, of being able to hold any representative position. That's what we want to go back to. That's what we want to preserve. I mean, seriously. Um, and yet somehow people are being sucked into it because of the way in which whiteness functions as a norm within that, and we haven't explored it, and we haven't certainly haven't deconstructed it. Yes, and, and I, uh, what I really liked in a chapter where you were talking about the um, exercises you do in kind of complex subjectivity in order to help people understand that, because yes, um, white people have always tended to choose their whiteness over, oh, we actually have much more in common with uh, people of our same class or maybe the same gender kind of thing, but have chosen that whiteness because that's you know where the power lies um but you, you kind of you do these excess and complex subjectivity to help people to see that well actually where do my commonalities lie and they might not lie with rich conservative whites who have no care for me and and um and how that can help actually you know help white people kind of get out of the mess they're creating for themselves well, that was a really interesting look at how those activities can um you know, in gender growth. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what was I gonna say? Oh, yeah, um, so actually, speaking of those exercises, um, I think it would be good to talk a little about kind of practical theology and, yeah. and Christian education, given that's, you know, uh, area of your expertise. Um, and you kind of begin, you have a few different points where you, you, you drop in on this conversation and you kind of begin early with the way that um, Christian education you know, needs to kind of be deconstructed and decolonialized um, in the way that it often, what we thought was just teaching good Christian values was often, you know, creating good imperial subjects uh, and, and, oops, and, and you're needing to break that down. Um, how, how, how do you, how have you started to, I guess, go about that in your work or if you're training trainers kind of thing, try to help people to see, okay, what are the things we've, just always assumed were part and parcel with the gospel presentation and uh, and how do we get like the jolt that alerts us to it? Maybe it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, in one respect, and certainly I think there's been a bit at least one criticism of the book that says, well, this is just Anthony Reddy doing what Anthony Reddy does. You know, <laughs> it's, it's not really about Brexit, it's just doing the same old thing. And although I would disagree, there's an element of truth in that. I mean, I have to admit there's an element of truth because there's a sense in which I have found a way of doing theology that I think works. Mm. Um, and by works, what I mean is 
that I worked out a very long time ago when I did my doctoral studies at Birmingham University with a wonderful guy called John Holt, who was uh, a kind of renowned religious educator in Britain. And I realized very quickly that one of the mistakes we often make is that we think in very cerebral ways. So we, so we try to educate people by giving them good logical arguments that will make links in their heads. And whilst I think there's a lot to be said by that, actually the truth is most of us are moved emotionally. Mm-hmm. That actually if we can tap into people's visceral emotions, we can get them to feel something. That then has a much bigger connection in terms of their learning than just giving people knowledge about stuff, you know? Mm. Um, and so I worked out very quickly that actually, so the use of exercises and games were ways of helping to conscientize people because if you could give them just a sense of, this is why something matters. I can say, and I can give you reams and reams of explanation. And at one level, it will inform you. It will give you an idea. It will give you some sense of knowledge of stuff. And that's not to be decried. So I'm not decrying that in any sense. But at another level, until, you're, until you can internalize it, until you can say, actually, I think I know how it feels. I mean, I don't know exactly. I can't say it maps on exactly to what you're saying, Anthony. But I've just had this insight, this sudden awareness of something. Not because it's an intellectual thing, but because I felt it in my bones. It's it's something that has made me, it's stirred up my emotions. And so one of the earliest exercises I did, which came up in, in, in another book, it, oh, but just this, it was almost, it's, it's almost a variation on like the old blue eyes, brown eyes exercise that was done in America many years ago. Mm-hmm. And although it's been decried in lots of places, in some respects, it's still one of the, great ways in which you help to teach issues of diversity and power and oppression is to say to someone well you know how it feels okay in just a tiny way i mean it's just a construct because the whole point of a game is that once it's finished and you come out of the role hey life goes on you know so it's not the same thing as but however that then becomes a bridge for you then to develop empathy to develop a sense of what we say in Christian theology, that we are brothers and sisters, keep it, that we care for one another, that what defines us as people of God, of people of Christ, is, a, is our love for one another. Look how they love each other, it is often said within the early Christian church. If, if that's true, then there must be some commitment to want to be in solidarity with other people and to be in solidarity with them you have to understand something of the experience that they're going through and how we can be allies across issues of race and class and gender and sexuality um, and across race that's what top, helps kind of top frame the exercises and therefore I kind of build that into the book because that's how I often do a lot of my theology is by working with groups and just trying out different things and see what they say and see what learning accrues for all of us really from that. And so that particular chapter, I think you're talking about in terms of complex subjectivity, I think it's chapter four, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, now you see me, now you don't. That for me was a real learning point because actually one of the things that came out for me is the way in which I have inherited a lot of 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 unreflected learning being an eldest male child within a patriarchal culture that has given me even as i think i am discriminated against for being a black male but i'm still a male i'm still an eldest child that therefore that has also afforded me particular opportunities and certain privileges being in a male body then it's not the case for my sister, who's the youngest of four, or for many women colleagues with whom I work who have not been given the same prominence or the same respect or the same opportunities because of gender. Mm. What the exercise did for me was to say, actually, whilst I'm critiquing the false consciousness of white people, particularly from the poorer white people who've been sucked into believing that they had a shared identity with the likes of Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, um, Actually, what I've also been sucked into is my own androcentrism and male privilege 
that has made me blind to the ways in which, as much as I think I'm an embattled post-colonial subject in a black body, it's a male black body and not a female one. Um, so I think part of the thing about what I often call transformative education that lies at the heart of the book is not, it's not therefore just about trying to diagnose something that's wrong. It's about saying, well, how then do we change it? And one way, it's not the only way. It's, it's not a panacea for, for kind of world transformation and domination. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Um, it's very much about, well, how then do we tap into people's emotions and give them the opportunity to, to develop empathy, to be better than all of us are at this moment in time and to believe that we can be more that. I think. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, and I think, you know, you also talk about, you know, teaching, uh, you're talking about how to read the Bible um, with groups um, and, you know, particularly coming from a black liberation theology perspective of that, you know, our, our uh, main concern shouldn't be about protecting orthodoxy or heterodoxy as determined by the privileged and the powerful, but with determining what brings full life, um, you know, and but yet, you know, as you say, the, the Bible is a, a pretty sacred to a lot of people and, and, and something that needs to be very much protected and something that is can very easily be assumed to have a flat reading. But as we've kind of talked about, the concepts of flat or normativity or unexamined always are going to tend to fall towards preserving uh, the status quo. What have you learned over your time doing kind of education around reading the Bible for helping people take these steps into realising well, I am reading this in a particular time and, and that changes yeah. it to how you read it in a different time or a different body and and that some of these texts are word of God and some are word about. Like, you know, how, how what have you learned? Because I'm sure there's lots of, mm. we, we got plenty of ministers watching these things. I'm sure lots of working with churches who are like, yeah, if I could just get them to understand a little yeah. more, um, I'd get four less emails every Monday morning. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, firstly, and you're absolutely right, that, that the scriptures are hugely important for many communities across all theological perspectives and cultural, racial, ethnic uh, class dispositions. It's, still a, it's still, a, still a normative text that tells us about who God is and what God wants and what are God's purposes in the world. Therefore, I think it's important. That's why there's still a chapter in there in the book. I think what I've learned is, is the way in which many of our different traditions have taught us to read against our own interests in terms of what texts can mean and their implications for life. Yeah. Um, particularly the more disadvantaged the group is and the more conservative the posture they hold to the scriptures is the more that there is an obvious form of dissonance between what the text is saying and its implications for the world of how we live and the reality that faces many people that is not the same thing as what the scriptures are purporting to be advocating. And yet somehow this normativity of the Bible then means that you simply ignore your own reality in order to preserve the existing position that was probably advocated by someone who was not in your position in the first place when they did, they did so. So one of the things I've often tried to help people to say is that what happens in front of the text, what we bring to it, is as significant as what is being said on the pages itself, let alone the story that exists behind it in terms of its construction, you know, in terms of all the technical stuff that that we are biblical experts, of which I am not one, I mean, are doing when they're doing their kind of exegetical work. But I've, you know, I mean, it's always been interesting to me the way in which particular issues of race and class have often been edited out in terms of how we read biblical texts. And so, for example, the classic one that I don't necessarily use in, in, in this particular uh, this particular book, but said I've wrestled with on other occasions, are things like how we look at 
are Jesus' parables. So the parable of the talents, for example, I think in, in Matthew's gospel, um, has always been in it's always been one of those fascinating ones for me that I've kind of come back to on several occasions. So I've kind of re reused it on in lots of different places. But like the number of people who will say, well, of course, the whole point of that is about working hard and using the gifts that God has given us and not being lazy. That was the crime of the third person. All he did was he just sat down and didn't do anything. And when you say to people, okay, so let me ask you this question here. Why do you think the master should be equated to God? Because the master, by his own admission, is cruel, is greedy, wants profit made by other people. And in the end, like the crime of the third person was simply to give back the master that which he gave him. He didn't rob him. He said, well, actually, you gave me this here, take it back. But he's incensed. When he's accused of being hard and cruel, he doesn't say, actually, how dare you say those things about me? He says, actually, if you know those things are true, Therefore, he's not denying it. Then at the very least, actually, at the very least, you should have put it in the bank so I get interest. So when you then say to people, is this really the God of Jesus who forgives and is generous and is loving? I mean, is that really the God? Do you see that thing? They say, oh, yeah, but it must be because it's, it's a parable that Jesus told. But even when your own experience tells you that this does not seem like the God you're saying your prayers to, doesn't it seem that this God is maybe, is not actually a God at all, but he's an exploitative master. And the key, te and the key passage that I read years and years out when I was at Sunday school, I never once ever opened my eyes to this until years later when I'm, I'm writing this as a Bible study to go with my books, is where it says, um, so it's something like I'm paraphrasing now, to those that have, more will be given. And to those that have little, even the little they have will be taken from them. And I was taught to read this as spiritual gifts. Those that have lot will get more, and those even have little will take off. Even at the base of spiritual gifts, it still seems a tad unfair, by the way. I mean, you know, it still seems a, a, a little bit problematic. But actually, if you then say, actually, maybe we've been taught to spiritualize this, because we see this in terms of economics, those that have will be given lots more. Or those that have the little they have will be taken from them. That seems like, that seems like liberal economics. That seems like capitalism. I wonder why it is that, like, the church doing deals with large corporations and with large imperial powers over the years has taught us to believe that the villain is the third person who simply resists by saying, you know what I mean? I'm not going to go out and bust my butt to make money for you so that you can live well. I'm not going to, I'm not going to play the game, but I'm not going to rob you. Here's your money, take it back. That's the villain. So, so the heroes are the ones who go out unquestionably and work really hard, having been given more resources in the first place anyway. So it wasn't even a fair, it wasn't even a fair distribution in the first place. But somehow this is as it should be. And we read that, I read that year in, year out until about 10, 15 years ago. And suddenly I thought, blimey, this is not, <laughs> you, know, I mean, you know, I mean, why did I get so conned into this? And and so the thing I've learned over the years, I mean, it's a long waffling way of answering your question, I apologize, is that some people then feel liberated. They say, wow, so I don't have to take all this at face value. No, you don't. I don't have to assume that just because it's in the text and it says this, it is the word of God. No, you don't. Is it just? Is it righteous? Is it promoting full life? Don't promote full life for that third person, by the way. You know, so is it something that we should replicate? Not always. We should challenge it. For some people, that is hugely liberating. Even to the point where some people actually then get angry and say, but if that's a possible reading, is it something you just made up? And I say, nope, you didn't make it up. It's always, it's always been that. That reading has always been a possible reading for as long as that text has been in evidence. And various points in history, people have 
invoked it as, as, as a way of challenging existing norms. Then they say, but if it's always been around, then why haven't I been told about it? Why have I been locked into having to follow something that has never done me any great benefit? Why? And I say, well, because there's always been a collusive way in which knowledge has been constructed that is not about freeing ordinary people. Conversely, there are some of the people who, when you then offer them the opportunities, they do the equivalent of putting their hands over their ears and going, la, 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 and I want, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to hear this because what you're asking me to do is to take responsibility for asking questions of the text where it's just much easier to say, this is what the minister says, this is what the priest says, this is what the church authority says, and I should follow it because it's the normative status quo position. It's much easier to go along with that. So I would say that although I have lots of fans who will say, well, you know, Anthony, now that you've opened my eyes, I'm not going back. I'm really going to ask questions about the faith and ask questions about its praxis in terms of relationship to everyday living and collective living and societal organisation in ways I have not done before. If I be one person who does that, there are still others who will say, no, we're not interested. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I often think in those terms that, um, you know, in baseball, if you bat 300, you're basically a Hall of Famer. So, you know, even three out of yeah. 10 success rate is, is, is good. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, as we're, we're getting close to, to time, but um, I did throw to Twitter before the interview to see if people yeah. had questions they wanted to ask. And there was one from... Um, Levi Booth that I, I wanted to ask, uh, ask sure. where we can extrapolate from it and go in some different directions. So he has uh, Christians who voted leave have a responsibility to increase their giving to overseas mission to offset the effect Brexit has on currency exchange rates. Uh, now, I guess, you know, it offers that for us a discussion point. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've got some places we could go for it, but do you have any initial reactions uh, from that idea? Yeah. Um, oh, good lord! Wow, that's a. It's, I mean, that's a. It's it's a generally interesting, novel question. Uh, and again, how much acreage of time has been taken up on Brexit? One does not hear many original questions. <laughs> that's a genuine one. In that, I'm generally. Yeah, I mean, I'll probably need to think that through. But I, I, th I think instinctively, I think. I think he's onto something. I think there is something about the insider mentality of Brexit that has divorced us from the wider world, that one still sometimes hears the rhetoric of sort of charity begins at home. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to look after our poor here rather than think about overseas mission, think about uh, aid to other places. I, I think my response would be twofold. One actually comes from my younger brother who does a lot of work in this area. That's my brother called Richard. And he often has a phrase where he says, well, people say charity begins at home. Fair enough, but it doesn't end there. It doesn't end at home. There is still a mandate to be part of a global world and part of um, issues of world poverty in which Britain has, is deeply implicated, both in terms of imperialism and empire that has created uh, instability in various other parts of the world that then leads to economic poverty, as well as the fact that we've benefited from having an empire and taking resources from the very places now that we somehow feel aggrieved at giving aid to. So I think he's probably onto something. Uh, and, and the fact that people vote leave, well, should they give more? Well, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a, I'm saying moot point, I think it's an important thing to consider, but I would say the implications of people who have voted to leave and to withdraw from broader links with other countries is problematic. And actually, I would say is not Christian in that regard, that actually our identity of being part of the body of Christ is not limited to our borders. It is, it is a link to all peoples who all people have been created in the, in, the, in the image and likeness of God, and we are called to be in relationship with people and to help people out. And therefore, I think Christian mission, mission work is an expression of that. 
you know, I was thinking, um, when I saw what I was thinking, I think I just saw today or yesterday, I think Virginia Theological Seminary is going to engage in, I think, giving 1.7 million in reparations. That number could be entirely yeah. wrong. But like, yeah. you know, like, we yeah. just, and as you say, this, as, with the, the thrust of the book being about the bigger issues of colonialism, imperialism, exceptionalism, you, you the hope that as more and more theology locates itself in that legacy and history and, and considers it well that that would lead necessarily to chapters on things like reparations and, yeah. and a, a deeper concept of reconciliation than um, let's be friendly. Um, yeah. So yeah, maybe that's what, what this is pointing yeah. to is a trajectory. Is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and there is a growing movement now for reparations. Uh, coming both from the Caribbean in particular, but the, uh, most like from African American communities in solidarity with African communities as well on the continent, that says actually you cannot have true reconciliation within the Christian context without restitution and without what I would call restorative justice, which is another way of talking about reparations. And certainly in the previous book, I talked about Zacchaeus and certainly within the Council for World Mission, for whom I presently work, we have. Well, but we are working with others in terms of developing a Zacchaeus tax mm. that is really about getting corporations and large institutions A, to pay proper tax, because oftentimes you've uh, you got this utterly inimicable situation whereby it's the poor people who pay, who pay more taxes than large global institutions. I mean, how can that be, right? Um, but also, it's not just about uh, that tax. It's also about profits and capital that's been accrued through injustice and through forced labour of slavery. And and it's interesting that in Britain, so, so the British state, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but only recent, last maybe last four or five years, paid off, finally paid off the loan they had to take out in order to pay off the slave owners. In so slave owners got something in the region of 20 million pounds. In, 19, in early 19th century money that is colossal billions now. And essentially, myself as a British subject paying my taxes, I'm paying my taxes to help the government to pay off the compensation that it gave to slave owners who enslaved my ancestors. I mean, how the hell does that work? So therefore, I think corporate reparation is not about, it's not about, it's, Gone blank. It's not about a punitive attack against the status quo. It is about restitution. It's about saying, to quote Bonhoeffer, to quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that this notion of cheap grace, you cannot have forgiveness without there being a cost. Mm. There's a cost of transformation. The cross tells us the cost for there's a price for freedom, mm. struggle. And, and restitution need to be done in order for penitence and for reconciliation to mean anything. And, and at this moment in time, what we are not getting is any concerted effort from the vested interests to realize the fact that until we have justice, there will be no peace. Mm. Yeah. Well, that would be, that's wonderful and a really strong place to end, except that to end Love, Rinse, Repeat, you play a game. Um, so, yeah, sure. so if people wanted the really profound end, you stop there. Uh, if otherwise, uh, we have a game called Pairings, uh, which is okay. yeah. uh, theologians and Brexit, and we need to pair it uh, with uh, a meal, uh, a piece of music, and then another book. So what, if you're sitting down to, to read this book, what, what's a good meal to have in front of you, something to you know, sustain you as you go? What's a piece of music to play while you're reading or you know, in between reading breaks? And then once you've finished it, what's another book that's, that's worth going to? Right, okay. So uh, a meal would be brown stew. So Jamaican brown stew chicken with rice and peas, coleslaw, Guinness punch, and a large sleep afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the meal. Yeah. Uh, that's what... That's what, that's what my mum used to cook when I was growing up. I wish I could cook like her, still miss it. Mm. Love it. Um, a piece of music, it would have to be Bob Marley's Redemption Song. Just simply because I think 
in that part of part of Marley's genius is that in two and a, a bit minutes he does what all my books have been sort of trying to do, but not as well as he does in, in, in that small bit of time. It just encapsulates everything that I think I've been sort of trying to live and do for the last 20 odd years. So it would have been by Marley's Redemption song. Um, and then in terms of another book, it would have to be some, it was probably going to be something really, really, I say trivial, it's not trivial at all, it's, it's, it's a great book, but it's just different. It would probably be, it would probably be one of Chester Himes' novels. So Chester Himes was an African-American black detective writer in the 40s and 50s. I will probably be his uh, book um, called Blind Man with a Gun, which is one of the books that are set in Harlem in the 1940s. And the two lead protagonists are called, are called Coffin Ed and Grave Digger Jones. And I mean, come on, you know, I mean, if your character is called Coffin Ed and Grave Digger Jones, you know that's a book that you've got to read. Yeah. So I'll probably yeah. say Blind Man with a Gun by Chester Hibbs. Wonderful. Well, thank you for, thank you for playing pairings and an even bigger thank you for coming on Love, Rinse, Repeat, the book Theologizing Brexit, a Liberationist and Postcolonial Critique. You can get it now where books are sold. I very much encourage people to check it out to engage the conversation. It is an important prescient and challenging but but very accessible and engaging read uh, especially as, as, as Anthony has mentioned there's personal stories there's stories from workshops uh, he engages cricket uh, the soccer the um, you know the, the whole gamut of British history it's, it's a really excellent book and I encourage people to check it out and uh, is there any other th ways people can connect with you or you want people to... Uh, yeah, well, I've got a website. So it's simply anthonyready.com. So people can post something on their website. They can contact me there either by email or they can or they can sort of see what other things I've written or what I'm, or, or what I'm getting up to. Or they can contact me via Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, and it's uh, Anthony Ready at, uh, at Anthony yeah. Yeah, on Twitter. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for joining us and uh, all the best as you uh, as the book continues to um, find its way around the world. Thank you very much. I had a great time and apologies like for my waffly conversation. That's what I do. Why, why you have one word where several words will do. That's all my motto. All good words. So there you go. <laughs> thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Thank you.